the question what were Native American peoples growing we get the three sisters which is corn beans and squash and so I'm here to tell you that for the most part the most sweep of human occupation of North America pre-European contact that was not the case can you imagine an in Indiana without corn and beans no. it existed it wasn't that long ago that it existed um, so tonight, uh, I'm going to take you through a couple of the time periods that, of human occupation here in North America. And I'm telling you this information through the lens of archaeology. Uh, there are a lot of indigenous stories and understandings of how they personally came here. I am not Native American, and so I'm telling you through this lens through the science of archaeology. And so when we talk about people in North America, when I ask how did people get here, normally if you think back into the pre-dawn misty times of your, you know, your high school or even earlier than that, uh, a lot of times they would say that Native American peoples arrived here over a land bridge. So there were glaciers on top of North America, the sea levels were much lower, which created an ice-free corridor and a land bridge between Asia and Alaska through the Bering Strait, and people walked. And that was a very accepted story for much of, much of what we have known as, as history or European history, our understanding of this. But in the last 20 years, things have moved to very forward, very quickly. And so we now acknowledge that there were coastal routes that people entered the Americas via boats. And do you see, do you see which ways I'm using? When I was in, when I was in graduate school back in the early 2000s, there was something they gave to us called the Salutrian problem. And they said it with a problem. <laughs> and the problem was, is they found a very distinctive point, and it was a stone tool, but that very distinctive point, they could only find two places where that point could have been found, or had been found up to that date. And the problem was, it was on the tip of Portugal, and on the tip of Brazil. And these stone tools date back roughly 30 to 40,000 years. So if you go back to the pre misty times in your head, you'd be like, excuse me, Ms. Kelly, I don't think, didn't they say it was 12,000 years ago people came here? Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, yes, that was the way it was a long time ago. 18,500 years right now is the most accepted, understood date. However, we're finding more and more and more information that's pushing human occupation of the Americas back further and further. Uh, in fact, um, breaking news last mm -hmm. year was the human footprints that were found in, uh, in Utah at one of the, I think it was the Sands National Dunes Park, and those were dating, they're thinking probably 20 to 25,000 years. Wow. So when we talk about the coast, <laughs> the Salutrian problem 20 years ago has since become the Salutrian hypothesis. <laughs> so more and more of these points have been found, and they do trace up and around what would have been the glacial edges of this half of the world, the European half. But mostly and very much accepted is that Western route into the Americas. And um, so interesting point, there was a, there was a paleo epidemiologist, oh. Woo someone who studies ancient diseases. And tuberculosis was a disease that, that comes from animals. And there are two strains <coughs> of tuberculosis in the world that we know of right now. And they both came from animals. One came the one in Europe, the tuberculosis that comes from Europe, came from sheep. The one that exists in America came from seals. Oh my God. Seals. 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 And so if you think about people skirting those coastal edges, what is an abundant food source? Seals. seals. Mm -hmm. And so we're, again, we have a lot of new evidence or new scientific stuff that people are, are claiming to. So our coastal Locations that we have actually found additional archaeological uh, sites that are underneath the ocean's edges on the Pacific. So we have pretty much verified that there is a coastal route. 
Island hopping. Um, I'm sure a lot of you people here may know of this little website called Ancestry.com. <laughs> and there's something called Genetic Genealogy that a lot of people are participating in. Um, for those of you that don't, you, know, you spit into a tube and you mail it off and then they come back with some pie chart saying you know, where they think your genes came from. Um, one of the interesting things kind of shaking out of that genetic genealogy is that there seems to be a very direct link between people in the Polynesian islands and people in the, on the edge of Peru. So again, Polynesian islands, Peru. There's a lot of ocean in between, but guess what? People have been in Australia for over 50,000 years. People were seafaring, so it's not a big leap to think that we had other forms of, of entree into the Americas, into the south. The ages at present, as I said, when you were in school, it was probably 12,800 years ago was the accepted settlement date of the Americas, which is interesting because the ice-free corridor, the land bridge, and we walked down in between the two big glaciers, that only started melting 13,000 years ago. And it didn't melt from the north to the south. It melted from the south to the north. And that land bridge is still very much a thought but it is not as uh, the only way as it used to be considered. So as of right now, uh, 18,500 years is more of an accepted date that archaeologists adhere to. And then, um, as I said, some dates in various places in North America and South America are coming back with 30,000 year old plus dates. We have a rock shelter in, uh, in Western Pennsylvania called Meadowcroft. There are dates coming from that rock shelter of 19,000 years. And again, people just didn't land in Pennsylvania. We have a site, uh, Monte Verde, in South America that has dates of 23,000 years. We don't understand. We're just getting more and more information. And where the final story will land, I don't think there ever will be a final story. Um, but people have been in the Americas for an extended period of time. But what is important to know is that the first peoples that arrived here came here when the Americas, well, the North America specifically, was an Arctic tundra. There were miles of ice sitting on a good portion of Canada and into the, uh, into the Americas. It was the Wisconsin Glacier. In fact, that is what made us flat basically all the way to Indianapolis, in case you're ever wondering why northern Indiana is flat. Because the, the climate of the temperature was much lower, plants had just a really hard time. And so most of the plants that existed then, that those mastodon would have been eating, were, imagine sagebrush for us. It's very cellulotic. There's not a lot of you know, good vegetation for these critters to have been eating. And so when people got here, our stomachs just are not made to digest cellulose. So it would be like me telling you to go out and you know, eat a maple branch probably wouldn't go over so well, because our stomachs are like, no. <laughs> so when people first got here, they were hunting and gathering. Um, and what little they could gather, they did, but mm, their primary diet was about 98% meat. And they were hunting large game, those mammoths and mastodons, Jeffersonian ground sloths. This is a mastodon. That is a Jeffersonian ground sloth. Oh my God. When they stood up, they could be 15 to 18 feet tall. They were big animals, but they were sloths. And so um, they were slower. They were also the ones eating that highly cellulotic material, but they were, you know, they, they converted it and they made them tasty to humans. And so those were the types of animals that people were first coming through. And people were moving around quite a bit. So not a lot of plant life. People are up and moving around and they're following animals. And we do that roughly until about 8,000 BC. And the reason why 8,000 is because those glaciers are, have melted. And at that time, the environment starts becoming more what we would recognize as, as you know, Indiana or Florida or um, Alaska or uh, Arizona. So at that time, we move into a time called the Archaic time frame. And it's during this time, because the climate has warmed, and there's more water in the environment. So if all that water that was locked up in glaciers is now being put into that water cycle, which means it becomes clouds and rain. 
which then hits the ground and encourages all these latent plant growth that still exists. Did you know some seeds can last thousands of years and be germinated? Isn't that cool? You're all sitting up underneath those glaciers. And so when, when rain started happening with more frequency, more and more different plant life started manifesting. And so this time frame we call the archaic from 8,000 to 1,000 BC. And it, the megafauna during this time, those big animals, they were pretty much, they disappeared. There's a lot of different reasons why they think they may have disappeared. One was overhunting, one was climate change. It's probably somewhere in the middle. But big animals had, had stopped uh, being around as much, so they were having to move to smaller game items. It's hard to believe that bison are considered smaller game items, right? Giant elk are smaller game items. And so they are starting to have to change the way that they're hunting. And because we have more plant life, now becomes the grand experiment. Now, out on Facebook, I am part of a lot of different foraging groups, and there is one of those memes that goes around and it shows ancient people sitting and eating plant life, and it's like, thank you to all of my ancestors who died figuring out what plants we could eat. <laughs> I hate to say that that's probably not too far off. Once we are now introduced to all of these new plant items, now we have to take time and learn how those, those food items can come into our diet safely. So we see a lot of experimentation, and at this time, we don't see, or at least the beginning, and this is a long time, this is 7,000 years, we don't see them actually cultivating anything. They are still hunting and gathering. We see seasonality in their diets. I'm waiting for the question, Kelly, how can you see seasonality in diets from people from 7,000 years ago? Uh, we can actually see if seeds or other plant material have been heated or cooled based off of certain um, things that we find in the dirt. We can see uh, there's this wonderful thing out there called paleofeces. And inside paleofeces has all sorts of fun things that are inside of it, including everything from parasites that people suffered from to what seeds of plants they were eating, what bone material. And so um, it is during this time frame that we start seeing people add into their diet and they're starting to pull away from meat, a solely meat diet and include these more regional foods. When we started entering in with harder plant material, it wears your teeth down. Imagine like if we're out there and we're chewing on gravel, you know, our teeth, I don't know, I chew on ice and my teeth would look horrible. Um, and so that kind of also gives you an idea. One of the other ways we can tell their diets are shifting is by skeletal evidence. We can do studies of certain skeletal ruminants and they can show us that certain chemicals that plants produce, like nitrogen, start spiking. If you ever have watched um, some of the shows out on the History Channel, there is actually a really good one that talks about being able to trace a woman from about two, and I do mean AD two, and um, they were able to trace the fact that she had, had been born in France, but ended up moving all over, all the way up into Denmark, all the way into Germany, and it was simply by the materials that they were able to pull from her teeth and her bones that showed different plant life and how it impacted her, her bone makeup. And so, um, so as people begin um, to start to rely on that plant life, one of the things that starts coming from that is that, well, there's just certain plants that they seem to be able to figure out a little easier than others. So anybody here garden? Anybody? Okay. Some, some plants are very persnickety, and no matter, everyone's like, oh, that's easy to grow. You try it, and it doesn't ever grow for you? Yeah. Um, they, we start seeing towards the end of this time frame, um, and honestly, we'll, we'll go through some of the plants that were present, but uh, some of our oldest plants that we see have been domesticated were roughly um, four, uh, let's see here, about 4,000 BC. So let's, uh, let's talk about that really fast. We're gonna forward just a little bit. So one of the things to know about the archaic People start slowing down, they become more regional. It's like, I like Florida, I like Maine, yeah, someone likes Alaska. So they're, they're staying in a much more regional location. 
their diets are starting to shift away from being solely meat-based. We start seeing certain plants reoccur in their diet, and uh, we do see start the early parts of plant domestication. And we'll talk about how do you know when a plant's domesticated. So then we'll fast forward a little bit into the time frame I really like a lot because I do work at Mound State Park. And uh, our mounds are square within that woodland time frame. And what, we will, what I will tell you, the difference between the archaic and the, the woodland time frame, is people are using plants much more. They have domesticated a few styles of plants. But they are not waking up in April and going out and breaking a, a piece of ground and making nice little rows and planting seeds. That's just not part of their lexicon. They are doing certain things which kind of advantageously help plants grow, but for the most part, they're not gardening. They don't have land plots that they're stopping and tending for months at a time. So we move into this woodland time frame, and that's 1000 BC to 1000 AD, roughly. And during this time, one thing that we do see is that people who are up and moving around and going from place to place to place, even, even just regionally, are starting to slow down. So instead of moving five or six times a year, now they're moving three times a year. So uh, during this time frame, we do start sh seeing a shift from people slowing way down. They're still somewhat nomadic, but they aren't completely sedentary yet. And that is this time frame that our mounds here in Anderson were made. 2,000 years ago, we're square inside the woodland time frame. So when, if you come to the park and I, you come on one of my mounds hikes, I will tell you straight up, there is no gardening, there is no corn, there is no beans. Ta da! <laughs> so, let's talk a little bit about things. So, the Hopewell, which uh, we attribute our mounds to be to the Adena and later the Hopewell cultures, they were not a backwater little place. They had connections all over the eastern half of North America. So, imagine the Hopewell interaction sphere being like that. You have a lot of cultures that are doing some basic things. And that's going to involve, for us, artifactual. So they're creating pottery in similar ways. They have stone tools they create in similar ways. And when I say that, how does the person down here in Florida know what the person up there in Michigan's doing? We have these people uh, that have similar culture all over the eastern half of North America, but everyone's doing things a little bit regionally. So here in uh, Anderson, we're part of this group called the Ohio Hopewell Grouping. Um, we're probably one of the more western outposts, but our people, for the most part, generally, I'm going to say generally, stayed in that Indiana, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Northern Kentucky t territory. But every now and again, they ventured out for trade purposes, for uh, spiritual pilgrimages, for a lot of different reasons. And they very likely had direct contact, whether in person or through storytelling, of all of these different cultures here in the eastern half of North America. Now this becomes really important here in just a minute, so hang on to this thought pattern. So when we start talking about plants, we start talking about the Eastern Agricultural Complex. Okay, so people are starting to slow down. How do we know that they're slowing down? And how do we know what plants they've domesticated? So when we talk about the Eastern Agricultural Complex, these are plants that we have seen either were highly used or were domesticated by Native North American peoples as early as 5000 BC. And there are things that you might recognize like squash um, and sunflowers, but you may not know about maygrass or little barley. So there's some of these plants that we no longer, we just see them as weeds if we even know how to recognize them in the first place. They were domesticated and grown in great quantity by Native American peoples for their nutrition content. And so when we start talking about the Eastern Agricultural Complex, I'm going to tell you that our, our data size is um, in a lot of rock shelters. They're in a lot of delta scenarios, so again, near water. Um, of course, you know, if you didn't have you know, watering fountains, where would one stay close to? You stay close to your water. And so we're getting information from those locations to, to talk a little bit more about this. Some of them are found in caves in Tennessee. 
Some of them were found in um, Missouri. So I'm not going to say every plant I'm talking about tonight and the dates I'm telling you are not here in Anderson, Indiana, we know. What I'm saying is regionally, with groups that we know were out talking and, and trading, we do know that these things were present in these locations at these times. Okay, so it's not quite Anderson, quite specific, but let's, uh, let's start our little journey. So, North American earthworks have been built for over 5,000 years here in the Americas. Some of our oldest earthworks are in Louisiana. And this picture right here is a representation of Poverty Point, which is in northern Louisiana. It's uh, dated to roughly 3500 BC. Um, we have another one that's slightly older called Watson Break, and it is in that almost 3800 to 4000 BC. And interestingly enough, also in the news recently, there are two mounds on Louisiana State University campus that they are starting to get dates out of those two mounds that are blowing everyone out of the water. And I can't tell you that we believe them yet, but some of the dates that are coming out of there are 19,000 years old. So people have been in Louisiana a long time. <laughs> and when we start seeing earthworks being built, they were being built right along those riverways. So again, we're sticking our waterways. Not only is it for water, but it's also for transport, right? And so um, anyone who's been to the park, I tell this joke just a little bit. I have visitors that come often and ask me why uh, mounds were built so far away from the interstates. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I get to reply, well, they're not on our interstates, but they are on their interstates, which would be all of our water, navigable waterways. And so people were starting to create more, what I'm going to say, more permanency, and even during this time frame when uh, Poverty Point, it, they, this is still a nomadic culture, but they're at least coming back to this location year after year after year. And uh, anybody here ever see what happens after a flood? What happens? Other than the grounds being really soggy. Everything's dis dispersed. Everything's dispersed. Mm -hmm. And the ground is generally churned up, right? And so if we waited three months after a flood, and we had just cleared off this land, it's beautiful, it's pristine, it's clear, then it floods, and three months later, what do we find growing in there? Thank you, weeds, everything we don't want, right? So we are not very different than humans in the past. We notice this three months later, and now I've got all of these plants that I'm not really sure where they came from. And people started puzzling out that as the ground was being disturbed, and specifically around waterways, that they had an influx of plant growth. And as they were being advantageous, they were going out and they were trying some of these plants and seeing if any of them had any nutritional value. And guess what they found? They did, very much so. There started to become an association, even 5,000 years ago, that Disturbed ground, especially near riverways, tended to be locations where plants like to grow. They also started puzzling out that seeds of the plants are inevitably what leads to more plants. And so when we talk about early cultivation, we're not talking where I've got a sack full of seeds and I'm going out and I'm doing rows. Very likely it was, I like this plant, and I'm going to cut it down, and there's something about this plant, that if I take it over here to this river bottom that's just flooded, and I beat the plant on the ground, <coughs> and I come back in three months, ta-da, I might have more of that plant. And so, again, these, these guys were insanely smart. They had the time to figure it out, but they were very smart. They were figuring out where does the growth start with plants, and it was puzzled out that it was seeds. And then they also were doing something that um, a lot of modern gardeners really hate. Okay, hold your boos and your hisses, okay? They were genetically modifying plants. Ooh, right? So when I say that, not like we do today, but they were noticing that if they kept two plants that had a valuable resource, which generally is their seeds, together, and those plants produce a lot of seeds, then they can 
Stop using these that don't have as much of a seed body. Focus on these and their kids or their you know, mm -hmm. progeny will have also bigger seed yield. And so, again, way back, remember Mendel? He was that monk who was some pea plants? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these folks were on it long before he got there. Mm -hmm. And so what they did was they started piecing things together. <clears throat> we need plants, seed bodies, we need disturbed soil. How can I make this happen someplace else? How can a human make that happen someplace else? Thank you. You transport it. So now I'm going to take the plant that I like, and for three months out of the year I'm by the river, and for three months out of the year I'm living in this rock shelter. And I'm not going to walk all the way to the river to get my food because, you know, people are people. Mm -hmm. And so I might take that same plant material and take it and disturb soil and beat it up here and see if the same thing happens. And so a lot of the places, remember I said we found seed bodies from rock shelters mm -hmm. and from delta plains. So we see people moving that stuff around. Okay, awesome, right? Mm -hmm. So now, I'm, I'm out in the woodlands, and I want this to happen again. So instead of just letting it be kind of causal, you know, eh, I'm going to try it here and see what happens, they start doing something a little bit more intentional. What most people know as slash and burn technology was applied right out here at Anderson Mountains. They would come in, they would burn the location. When you burn something, a lot of times there's much extra nitrogen in the soil, and there's a lot of plants that really like that. And um, it also cleared the area out. If you come to the park today, I'm going to talk to you about wildflowers. And the one thing I'm going to tell you is once those trees crown out, nothing's going to grow underneath them because they take all the light, right? Mm -hmm. So now if I wipe the trees off the map, and I have created extra nitrogen in the soil, and then I then go a little bit further and help disturb the soil, whether it's through raking or dancing or you enter interway here that those plants would then now grow in that area just as well as they would in the deltas and the areas outside the rock shelters. We see this cycle start happening. And okay, so Kelly, how can you see this cycle happening? It happened thousands of years ago. When something is burnt, it leaves a thin layer of ash in the soil. And if it happens year after year after year, we see it layer after layer after layer. And then, a lot of times what we will see is certain areas that have more disturbed soil beds. <coughs> and again, uh, earlier I was talking with someone else, archaeologists, we spend a lot of time learning how to read dirt. And so, we can see these subtle changes, and what we find is, as time moves forward, maybe during the middle woodland time frame, maybe even while the mounds were still in use here in Anderson, people had started picking up the fact that if they took these plants and put them here, slash and burn, disturb the soil, put the plants there, and now they need to wait three months for their investment to give yield, people are starting to slow down. And they're coming cyclical. They're starting to come back to the same places over and over and over again. So now, if in the fall, there are some plants that really like to have their seeds frozen. So in the fall, little barley was one of those you would disturb the soil in the fall, lay little barley down, and guess what happens if you come back in the early spring? Little barley is ready to be harvested. It's actually one of the first grains of wildness here that is easily harvested in March. So when we come back to, uh, people ask me, Kelly, how, how do you know that this plant was domesticated? So when we talk about domestication, that's when we really know that people have their hands in it. So we've spent a lot of time teasing this plant to become something that we need it to be. I need those seeds to be bigger. I need more seeds because that's where my nutrition is. Hey, it would be really great to get a few greens off that. So let's see if we can tinker with this plant over a long period of time to get what I need out of it. And when I say I, I mean humans. And so the signs of domestication that we look for are larger seed size. So this is from the McClung Museum in Knoxville, Tennessee. I love this panel. Um, 4,200 years ago, that guy down there was, um, yeah, that's helianthus. So that's a sunflower seed. Here. 
To give you an idea of actually what it looked like, it's a little bigger than a poppy seed. By 1100, it had grown exponentially over 100 times. And we start seeing those over and over and over again. Uh, helianthus, or sunflowers, were domesticated. And to boot, we see more seeds. So let's just take it, let's just take it to the extreme. Anybody here, okay, I didn't see too many gardeners, but anybody here go and look at seeds and you see those big mammoth sunflowers? Yeah, those are awesome, because they give you hundreds and hundreds of seeds in one plant. So we started seeing that they are actually teasing out those sunflowers. Um, if you come and look at some of our native uh, sunflowers, uh, not to not to put a fine point on it, but the Friends Native Plant Sale has happening on March, uh, or sorry, May 13th. Mm -hmm. um, we actually sell some native sunflowers. When you actually look at their seed heads, they're hmm, about that big. Oh. Yes, little. Yeah. Okay, now we move into what we understand as sunflowers. They have these big discs and all of those seeds that are in there. And again, that's what that's what humans need for nutrition. So increase of seeds. Thinner seed walls. What is that all about? Plants are smart. They want their seeds to be distributed as far as possible. And uh, one strategy for a plant to spread its seeds far is to be excreted by an animal who's eaten them. And it does, it does the plant no good if that seed has had damage going through an intestinal tract. So they create very thick seed walls to protect that seed packet so it can then be planted. So thinner seed walls means that we get more nutrition because our bodies are able to pull that apart and access that nutrition. So let me put another fun point. Um, so Europeans get here and there are fields of corn and all of these Native American peoples are eating corn and we're like, hey, this is kind of a cheap and easy food source. So they took that corn, they took it back to Europe, they gave it to all their serfs and their plebes out in the fields, and uh, guess what happened? People started dying of malnutrition. A, they stopped using more traditional food sources. B, those, if they had paid attention to the Native American peoples who were trying to show them actually how to use corn, they were grinding it up, they were breaking those seed walls. So the stuff goes to, to Europe, and Europeans, there, there is no nutritional value going through their systems because they didn't learn how to process it correctly. Mm -hmm. And honestly, today, our corn seed walls are much thinner than even the maize of that time frame was. We look at that. We look at uh, increase in fleshy interior of the plant. Um, everybody here has carved a pumpkin at some point? Yeah, it's kind of semi-hollow and it's got all this stringy stuff versus a squash which a lot of times has flesh all the way up to the seed bodies. Yeah, that's, that's, that's people. People did that. If you leave uh, squash to its own nature, it will hollow out and retract away from its seeding body. Um, because people, we want to eat that. And then uh, shifting needs of growing season temperatures and times. So what seeds were Native American peoples eating? What, were they, what, what plants were they domesticating? Squash. Squash, interestingly enough, <coughs> gourds are not native to the Americas. There are two original gourd sources. One was from Africa and one was from Asia. They took a gourd that was, or several gourds, that were grown in Africa and threw them in the ocean with GPS trackers on them. If they were tracking the, the currents and waves of the ocean, and out of the eight or nine that they did, three of them made it to Florida. Interestingly enough, some of the oldest domesticate seeds that we see of Curburita pepo is in Florida. So squash Curburita pepo, it's one of the very first domesticates. The, that time frame I've got up there, if you guys go on eight different websites, you're gonna get eight different date spans, but they're roughly gonna be in that time frame. So uh, some of the earliest domesticates of squash we see here in the Americas was roughly 5,000 BP, so that's 3,000 BC. They were found, uh, they, some of the sites are 7,000 years old, but we don't see the seeds being domesticated at that time. 
It's not until about 3,000 years later that we start seeing those seed sizes start getting bigger and bigger. This is one of those plants that they think it was originally used for utilitarian purposes. <clears throat> Gourds. They were water transporters. They were seed containers. They were a lot of different things, but they weren't necessarily eaten. However, later in time, we start seeing that fleshy material on the inside and that rind start showing up in people's diets. Most people cuss this in your backyard when it shows up. There are weed killers that immediately go after this, and this is called goosefoot or lambs carters. Uh, just for funsies, the, the Latin name chinopodium actually does mean goose foot, podium foot, chinna, goose. Um, these not only are their seeding bodies excellent for those oily, starchy seeds, but you can also use the greens. <clears throat> the goose foot that we have today is not the domesticated variety. It has rewilded or become it's feralized <laughs> um, back into its native state. But this plant was highly and widely used. And uh, again, about 3,800 before present. So about, you know, roughly 2,000 years BC. It's closely related to quinoa. Anybody here like quinoa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you actually, even today, um, modern foragers, you can cook that and it tastes a lot like quinoa. Erect knotweed. Now, if anybody does garden or know anything about invasive species, you're probably going, wait, isn't that like, not right. There is a Japanese knotweed that is invasive, uh, but this is a native knotweed, the erect version, and uh, again was domesticated. Um, this one has probably the most scientific literature on it because we do see seed size start to um, increase, so some domestication, but then it kind of doesn't really get there. And what archaeologists started finding is that's because um, they cooked it really fast. So they were looking at these seed sizes and that were poofed and wonky and, and they were saying that this because they were being cooked frequently. When we were taking dirt from a location, if you put that dirt in water and shake it up and let it sit, things will settle at different rates. What doesn't really settle much is plant material. And it actually floats on top. And it wasn't until about 74 that this started being utilized as a scientific technique. It wasn't until the early 80s that it gained hardly any traction, but prior to that, we were spitballing. We think corn was there when people first got here. It was kind of revolutionary for us to go through and go, okay, I'm sorry, wait, corn? What, corn didn't get there until when? And it was because, and we actually call it flotation. So now there's a lot of dirt from a lot of locations that we will take and we will float it, which basically means we just shake it in a jar of water, actually they're like big 50 gallon drums, that's point, and we will skim off the biologic material off the top and we can get pollen and seeds and we can do very exact testing on dates and DNA, really cool. So if you guys ever go back and you're looking at scientific papers, which you guys may or may not, you're gonna notice that there's not much before 1980. That's simply because technology hadn't really caught up yet. Sunweed or marsh elder. Um, this is something, guys, that you may have walked by along the river and never given it a second thought. Um, again, it was primarily in, uh, for its seeds. They're similar to sunflower seeds in taste. I've actually found some of this and tasted it. I would say it does have that kind of that nutty flavor that sunflower seeds give you. Maygrass was not domesticated. Maygrass is one of those proliferous plants that just go and go and go, so they never needed to domesticate it. But there are caves in various states where they have found sheaves that would have weighed about 100 to 150 pounds that people had cut and were storing for the time that they could winnow it down to its grain. So again, we find them in caves and rock shelters. Uh, we find them a lot in paleo feces. Uh, and, um, it's widely cultivated. Cultivated means I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm using it in my diet, but I'm not physically growing it. I'm not, I'm not tinkering with it. Helianthus um, is also another one of those older domesticates. Um, very much cultivated for its seeds. As I said, uh, domesticate seeds are 10 to 150 times 
the original size of a wild sunflower. Um, they were eaten whole and shelled. Yeah, I guess they still do it today. I've seen some people go either way with sunflower seeds, which I think is kind of gross, but whatever. Um, and uh, we find a lot of these sites, um, the oldest sites we find are actually in Tennessee and Kentucky. And little barley, that's one that I was saying that they would uh, kind of pound the ground in the late fall and it would come up. You guys have seen this, I promise you. Yeah, yeah come, come here in a couple months to the park, look in the fields on either side as you turn into Mounds Road, it's all over the place. And again, it was uh, one of the very first grains that they could harvest in spring before a lot of our other wild edibles become um, nutritionally available. And um, one thing I will say though, the Ohio Hopewell, so the people at Mounds, they didn't dig this stuff as much as a lot of other places did. They're like, eh, eh. But it's everywhere. But they, they didn't, as they were the only Hopewell grouping that did not use this material in a lot of their culinary or edible forms. Was it around and we found it in archaeological context, which means that people were cutting it down? Yes. So archaeologists, we like to make connections. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to cut something down and spend, spend energy doing it, but you're not getting any return off of it, where's your return coming from? Trading. Trading. Maybe, maybe. How about spiritual? Oh. Did we find it in the context of a lot of mound situations? <clears throat> we do not know. I can't go back and ask what this was all about. But the Ohio Hopewell folks, we tend to find these in association with um, other materials in mound locations. Corn was a grass. In fact, you have some of its, its, uh, its cousins that if you don't mow your yard frequently, sometimes you see things growing up that look like corn. Yeah, you're not too far off. So Teosente is the name of the grass, and this is the grass right there. It is tall, it looks a lot like corn, it just does not have the cobs that we're expecting off of it, and it's a lot thinner. This material, uh, they domesticated this stuff um, about 8,000 before present, 8,000 years ago. So, Kelly, didn't you just say there was no corn in Indiana? And I'm like, yes, because this is a Central American food. And uh, it took people a very, very, very long time of that Mendel process of pulling it together, getting those seed bodies from the little teeny tiny tassels to now being looking more like cobs. Has anybody ever really seen what some people would call maize today? Cobs are like that big. Yeah, and now imagine, you know, our cobs. And so they worked a very long time to get it into an edible format that we would understand. Maids, as we know it, did actually enter the United States, or what would become known as the United States, in the Southwest as early as about 2000 BC. The problem was, is that it didn't, it took thousands of years to get it worked around to where it could live in a much shorter growing season with slightly more variable temperatures to a, a place where it could actually be used as a stable food source. So corn, as we know it, in Indiana, didn't really start being planted here until about, oh, 300 AD. Hmm. And we don't see it as a significant form of nutrition for Native American peoples until 500 AD. By the way, people stopped using the mounds here in Anderson roughly about 350 to 400 AD. Hmm. So they would have known about it, but they weren't eating it. How do we know we weren't eating it? Remember that seed body I was telling you about? There's something in it called niacin. It is a, it's a B vitamin. Mm -hmm. And the moment that people start consuming that, we see nitrogen levels in the skeleton just shoot up. You know what the other thing we see in morphology, that's people parts that we see happen when corn hits? Cavities. Cavities. Mm -hmm. Corn has a lot of sugar content. Mm -hmm. And you know what else we see? Obesity. Osteoporosis. Corn was great. Sort of. What about those other plants? That bean stuff. 
Beans come in about two to 300 years later than corn. It actually didn't really get here until about 600 AD. Hmm. Yeah, so the three sisters didn't exist until the Mississippian time frame. Uh, tobacco arrives roughly about the same time as beans. So again, about 600 AD. Again, all both of these are Central American plants that had to be teased to get them to where they would relatively survive in our, in our temperate environment. So that leads to the last period of time. So all throughout time, Native American sweet, they're nomadic, they're hunting and gathering, they're living off the land. They're starting to play with plants, but that is not their primary food source. 70% of their food source was still pretty wild and seasonal. Until corn. And this is awesome because it is a stable food source that is relatively easy once it gets used to the, the growing conditions to live. So starting, remember I said about 500 AD, they start growing this? By 800 AD, we see this massive civilization, and I'm gonna use that word, civilization. Cities of 10,000, 12,000, 20,000, 50,000, 75,000 people all living together in one location with fields and fields and fields of corn, beans, squash, sunflowers, and tobacco. And it was supporting these massive populations. And you know what? People didn't need to move around much anymore. They settled down. They had permanent houses. Oh, it's great, right? Population boom. So what do we do when we get bored? We have babies. <laughs> Population boom. And you know, oh, this is great, right? And now we have time on our hands to sit around. Before we were generalists, we were just all making pots, we were all making stone tools. Some of them are pretty, some of them not so much. But now we have people who can specialize in making stone tools and beautiful pottery. We have people who can work with all of these exotic trade items that are coming in. I mean, it is a golden time. And people built their cities to reflect their agriculture. Did you hear the word I just used? Agriculture. Yeah, so we've left cultivation. We've left gardening. We're in agriculture now, friends. These retention ponds, which actually come from the dirt that they use to build their mounds, they place those retention ponds there on purpose to help irrigate their crops. And so, again, use of the land is just outstanding. You've got great minds all throwing in and just doing some amazing stuff. Until... So I would like to show this infographic a little bit because um, I am an anthropologist at the very soul of my being. In anthropology, we study humans. And if you ask any anthropologist what the ultimate downfall of man is, they will always say agriculture. Let's explore, shall we? And agriculture leads to sedentary settlements. Well, that doesn't sound like a bad thing, right? Well, until you need to cut down a tree for firewood or to build a house. Those trees grow back really fast? No. So where do you go to get your trees? The road. Further and further and further away. Guess who you end up running into? Some other guy. The, the neighboring city who was doing the same thing. Uh-oh. We have animal domestication. We have dogs that are domesticated. I'm going to tell you this, guys. They were domesticated when they came over. That's not a big thing. Um, there were no horses. There were no cows, no pigs. So that's kind of, all right, sure, animal domestication. Higher population density, right? More people, more time in our hands, more people to sit around and with their phones, right? Well, sort of, except at some point, bored people do silly things, like challenge each other. So all of a sudden, now we need something called government. Higher, uh, the social structure, hierarchical social structure. We have food surpluses. Sounds like a wonderful thing, right? Well, I deserve half of that because I, I grew it. Well, you deserve some of it too, right? Because it's your land. You deserve some of it too because you supplied the seeds. And then he deserves some of it because, you know, he's your Uncle Barry. At some point, it starts getting thinned out. And the haves and the have-nots start rocking the boat just a little bit. During this, we see better trade networks, which just seems to be a great thing. The only problem is, is more trade networks, more people. We just came out of one of these. <coughs> Epidemics. Epidemics. They had, they had communicable diseases. Syphilis was there, tuberculosis was there, 
you start having higher and higher populations, and now you're gonna have more and more communicable diseases. And here's another problem. This is, the, the Spanish, the Europeans, they weren't great but they're not quite as bad as sometimes we make them because they were just the straw that broke the camel's back. So now you throw in those weird little European things that Native Americans have no resistance against, but they're already living in these big massive cities. And guess what? It takes off like wildfire. Reduced female status, ladies. Yeah. Rise of the priestly class, male class. All of this material. Mono diet is horrible. Mono diets. They're eating corn. High sugar content, higher obesity, higher diabetes rates. We start seeing cavities, their health generally declines. We start seeing, um, again, they're overusing their native resources, and so they're having to go further and further away. So the deer aren't as plentiful, the fish aren't as plentiful. Hmm. They get into this, and then guess what happens in 1350? Something called the Little Ice Age. So the, the the world's temperatures dropped, I think they said between six and eight degrees. Remember what's really perspicuity? Corn. Corn. And so all of a sudden, these cities with thousands of people relying on these crops, there's crop collapse. And now we have a much bigger problem. Because now you throw already kind of weird things, you now make everybody hungry. And as you kind of come down and trickle down, demand for more resources, water, and eventually that leads to conflict. So a lot of times people say, Kelly, what happened? This was this golden age, and you had these massive cities, and what happened? And I'm like, corn. <laughs> corn. Uh, there, there is ups and downs, and you'll see anthropologists go back and forth about the presence of what we're going to consider a stable food source. In a lot of ways, it does lead to some amazing things. The problem is, is humans are humans, and we tend to do not great things with great things. And um, so by 1350, so long before the Spanish hit that coast, 1540 was the first entree by Hernando de Soto. And by the time he was coming through in 1540, there were many cities that had already collapsed, and there was nobody living there. Mm -hmm. They still found some culture that was there. They still found some cultures that were still doing the things that they were doing. So we have pretty accurate records of what the Mississippians were doing, kind of their cosmology and what they thought. The problem is, is that they were already on the, on the downward slope. So, there's a lot more going on than we originally gave, gave thought to. <clears throat> and so, plants, cultivation, Consistent food source is a good thing, as long as it's not over, you know, everything in moderation. Everything in moderation. And so now we enter into um, the historic age, and as I mentioned to some folks earlier, that's where I stop. Um, these plants obviously were being, this, this technology, and this is what this was, this plant technology was being shared with Europeans that came. This plant technology was um, Overutilized in some instances, and unfortunately, um, we all know how land ended up being with a lot of Native American peoples. They were taken from land that was fertile and moved into areas that, that wasn't as fertile. And it took a long time for these people who spent thousands of years creating these amazing plants to be thrown onto an uh, area that is not hospitable for the plants that they, they literally have grown up with. Um, you know, they struggle quite a bit. 